A few minutes ago, I signed an act to provide for the common defense by increasing the personnel of the armed forces of the United States and provided for its training. Soon thereafter, I signed the proclamation provided for in this act. Registration day by the President of the United States, a proclamation. Then follows a page and a half of excerpts from the act, what we call the whereas clauses. And it proceeds, now therefore, now therefore, I, Franklin D. Roosevelt, President of the United States of America, under and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the aforesaid Selective Training and Service Act of 1940, do proclaim the following. First, the first registration under the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940 shall take place on Wednesday, the 16th day of October, 1940, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Uh, secondly, every male person, other than persons accepted by Section 5A of the aforesaid Act, who is a citizen of the United States or an alien residing in the United States, and who on the registration date fixed therein has attained the 21st anniversary of the day of his birth and has not attained the 36th anniversary of the day of his birth is required to present himself for and submit to registration. Every such person who is within the continental United States on the registration date fixed herein shall on that date present himself for and submit to registration at the duly designated place of registration within the precinct, district, or registration area in which he has his permanent home, or in which he may happen to be on that date. Every such person who is not within the continental United States on the registration date fixed shall within five days after his return to the continental United States present himself for and submit to registration. Regulations will be prescribed hereafter providing for special registration of those who on account of sickness or other causes beyond their control are unable to present themselves for registration at the designated places of registration on the registration date fixed herein. Third, every person subject to registration is required to familiarize himself with the rules and regulations governing registration and to comply therewith. Fourth, the times and places for registration in Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico will be fixed in subsequent proclamations. Five, I call upon the governors of the several states and the Board of Commissioners of the District of Columbia to provide suitable and sufficient places of registration within their respective jurisdictions and to provide suitable and necessary registration boards to affect such registration.
I further call upon all officers and agents of the United States and all officers and agents of the several states and the District of Columbia and subdivisions thereof to do and perform all acts and services necessary to accomplish effective and complete registration. And I especially call upon all local election officials and other patriotic citizens to offer their services as members of the boards of registration. Seven, in order that there may be full cooperation in carrying into effect the purposes of said act, I urge all employers and government agencies of all kinds, federal, state, and local, to give those under their charge sufficient time off in which to fulfill the obligation of registration incumbent on them under the said act. America stands at the crossroads of its destiny. Time and distance have been shortened. A few weeks have seen great nations fall. We cannot remain indifferent to the philosophy of force now rampant in the world. The terrible fate of nations whose weakness invited attack is too well known to us all. We must and we will marshal our great potential strength to fend off war from our shores. We must and will prevent our land from becoming a victim of aggression. In the military selective service, Americans from all walks of life, rich and poor, country bred and city raised, farmer, student, manual laborer and white collar worker, will learn to live side by side, to depend upon each other in military drills and maneuvers, and to appreciate each other's dignity as American citizens. Universal service will bring not only greater preparedness to meet the threat of war, but a wider distribution of tolerance and understanding to enjoy the blessings of peace. Our decision has been made. It is in that spirit that the people of our country are assuming the burdens that now become necessary. Offers of service have flooded in from patriotic citizens in every part of the nation who ask only what they can do to help. Now there is both the opportunity and the need for many thousands to assist in listing the names and addresses of the millions who will enroll on registration day at schoolhouses, polling places, and town halls. The Congress has debated without partisanship and has now enacted a law establishing a selective method of augmenting our armed forces. The method is fair, it is sure, it is democratic, it is the will of our people. After thoughtful deliberation and as the first step, our young men will come from the factories and the fields, the cities and the towns, to enroll their names on registration day. On that eventful day, my generation will salute their generation. May we all renew within our hearts that conception of liberty and that way of life which we have all inherited. May we all strengthen our resolve to hold high the torch of freedom in this darkening world so that our children and their children may not be robbed of their rightful inheritance. 
And so the proclamation closes with my signature and with the seal, the great seal of the United States, and is attested by the Secretary of State. America has adopted selective service in time of peace and in doing so has broadened and enriched our basic concept of citizenship. Beside the clear democratic ideals of equal rights, equal privileges, and equal opportunities, we have set forth the underlying other duties, obligations, and responsibilities of equal service. In thus providing for national defense, we have not carved a new and uncharted trail in the history of our democratic institutions. On the contrary, we have merely reasserted an old and excellent of democratic government. The militia system, incumbent upon every free man, has its roots in the old common law. It has brought to this continent it was brought here by our forefathers. It was an accepted institution in colonial days. For nine out of the 13 original states explicitly provided for universal service in their basic laws. In those days, little was required in the way of equipment and training for the man in arms. The average American had his flintlock and knew how to use it. In addition, he was healthy and strong and accustomed to hardship. When he reported for military duty, he brought with him his musket and his powder horn. His daily life inured him to the rigors of warfare. Today, the art of war calls for a wide variety of technical weapons. Modern life does not emphasize the qualities demanded of soldiers. Moreover, behind the armed forces, we must have a munitions industry as a part of an economic system capable of providing the fighting man with his full requirements of modern arms and equipment. Many individuals, therefore, may serve their country best by holding their posts on the production line. The object of se selective military training, service, is to provide men for our army and navy, and at the same time disturb as little as possible the normal life of the nation. <laughs> 